Hello everyone, welcome, thank you so much for joining me as we look at the arts of India. We're going to be including in this discussion the arts produced in what are the modern nations of Pakistan and Bangladesh, as these areas have historically been culturally and artistically contiguous with the subcontinent of India. Now, this is a very, very large topic as art has been produced in the Indian subcontinent for thousands of years. And so in order to make this very large topic a little bit more manageable, today we'll be focusing specifically on art as it was produced for three of the major religions in this area, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam. Now, conveniently, the high points of artistic production for each of these religions uh, is generally uh, agreed upon to have happened chronologically. And so for Buddhist art, we will be focusing on the Gupta period. We'll be looking at the Chola period for Hinduism. And then finally, briefly looking at the Islamic Mughal dynasty. The earliest non-prehistoric Indian art was mostly Buddhist. Buddhism was founded on the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, a prince from northern India who at some point renounced his wealth and life of privilege and became a spiritual teacher. Uh, the accepted belief at that time was that all beings, including gods and spirits even, were caught in an endless cycle of birth and death and rebirth. So everyone is essentially locked into the system of the continual suffering that comes not just from living and from life, but also from having our attachments, our hopes and desires and wisdom, all anchored into the sens sensory physical world. So Siddhartha achieved enlightenment, that is, a higher understanding that lifted him beyond this cycle, so that when he died, his spirit essentially faded away, freed from suffering in a state called nirvana. And his title, Buddha, then means the enlightened one. One of the most iconic types of structures associated with Buddhism in India is a type of structure called a stupa. This is the great stupa at Sanchi, uh, Sanchi is a site that was developed and added to uh, over the course of hundreds of years. And indeed, the Great Stupa itself, which is the largest stupa at the site, uh, was built over a period of um, a few hundred years as the site was added to and changed and so forth. Stupas, as a type of structure, uh, developed out of the burial mound. And at Sanchi, the Great stupa is believed to contain the ashes of the Buddha, and stupas are often erected at sites um, that are considered holy. Now, the basic structure of a stupa uh, consists first of a mound of dirt and rubble that is encased in stone and stucco or plaster. And at the top is a platform uh, with three parasols. A parasol is a sign of honor, of status. And so having three of them indicates a higher honor paid to the Buddha, but it also signals the Buddhist uh, triad of the Buddha, uh, the law or Dharma, uh, and uh, the order, that's the third one, the Buddha, law, and order. Around the base of the stupa mound, there is a little railing, and then around that is a walkway that is uh, separated and given some privacy by a higher fence, and this outer fence is pierced by four gateways, or taranas. The devotee is meant to walk or circumambulate around the stupa mound in a counterclockwise fashion. Now, the four gateways, or taranas, are oriented towards the four cardinal directions, and at the intersection is the stupa mound, which means then that the stupa acts as a microcosm, or a small version or symbol, of existence. Um, the mound becomes a uh, tiny version of the world mountain, uh, that is the structure of the cosmos. And just as the three parasols uh, rise over the mound, the devotee, by circumambulating the mound, is hopefully led beyond these levels of existence um, and up into higher levels of understanding, um, just as the Buddha was able to ascend beyond uh, the lower levels in which we are currently stuck. The primary um, function of the stupa is this 
contemplative devotional um honorary function and there's no actual structure or rather interior to the structure which raises the question of whether or not it's actually architecture or whether it's more accurately called sculpture now the primary location for sculpture for decorative elements on a stupa are the railings and the taranas and indeed, at Sanchi, we have images of the Buddha, um, among the earliest images, really. And what's interesting about these early Buddhist images is that they don't feature the Buddha himself. Instead, in this image, for example, of the Buddha teaching the Sakyans, which it was his um, home tribe, uh, he is represented by an empty throne. So instead of seeing the Buddha in human form, as indeed his um, believer, his followers do believe that he lived in human form until he uh, died and then ascended. So instead of seeing a human Buddha, we have just this stand-in for him. We see a similar thing happening on this um, fragment from the wall of a different stupa. And this scene depicted here is uh, the river deities rising up out of the waters uh, as they recognize that the future Buddha is bathing in their waters. And so they um, have come up to honor him. And where do we see the Buddha? Well, he's represented by this pair of footprints that look like kind of like a loaf of bread. Now, we don't know why exactly early Buddhist art has this practice of not directly depicting the Buddha in human form. But at some point in the uh, second century CE, it does fade away and we begin to see what are called iconic um, or human forms of the Buddha represented in art. Here is, are two examples. The one on the left is unfortunately damaged, but you can see that it is almost identical to the one on the right, meaning that this is a type of sculpture that was produced en masse, uh, that, it was, um, is, that it is one of many different uh, relief sculptures. So we can look at the one on the right to get a more complete sense of what the one on the left would have looked like. And what's remarkable is that even at this very early stage, we have all of the iconographical elements, that is all of the symbols and all of the features uh, that will continue to exist and be central to Buddhist art for thousands of years. Now, again, this is because these are functional images. And so just as a car cannot serve its purpose of being a vehicle if it doesn't have wheels, uh, these contemplative devotional images can't function unless they have all of the appropriate elements. So some of the key elements to uh, images of the Buddha are his yogic meditation pose as he was meditating uh, under the bodhi tree, a type um, fig tree, uh, when he achieved his moment of enlightenment. He has a downcast gaze, which is more emphasized on later um, images than it is here, but it emphasizes that he is looking inward rather than outward at the world. The lotus marks on his the soles of his feet uh, indicate his enlightened status, his status as the Buddha, as does the lotus throne. Lotus as being a very common symbol uh, of rebirth, enlightenment, uh, wisdom, purity, and so forth. Um, the throne is supported by three lions. Uh, lions are a symbol in India of royalty. And in contrast to these royal symbols, he is wearing a very simple robe that is draped over his left shoulder. And he is either represented as having um, his right shoulder bare or both sh shoulders covered, always by this very simple robe. The elongated ears are because he was a prince um, and wore heavy earrings that stretched his ears. Uh, and then he gave that life up. So we, rather than seeing the earrings, we see simply the place where they would have been, reminding us of this surrender, of this giving up of uh, worldly wealth in, in order to achieve true wealth, um, this enlightenment. 
The parasol that frames his head uh, also forms a halo uh, and a sun. He's clothed in the sun. And the center of that halo is the orna, which is a tuft of hair between the eyebrows that, again, signals his status as the Buddha. And then on top of his head is here a kaparda, or kind of snail shape. Um, later it becomes an ushish, ushnisha, and that is a cranial bump. So it is, in either case, a sign of his heightened wisdom. Uh, it's almost like he's so wise his skull can't contain it, and so it kind of pops out in this bump. And then finally, he is making a gesture with his hands called a mudra. And this particular mudra means uh, fear not, the abhaya mudra. Mudras are extremely important in Indian dance, which is a really um, complex and rich um, facet of Indian culture. And they are used to convey information about a person, about their emotions, their being, um, and they are really essential in visual arts of India. So what's really fascinating, as I mentioned, is that even at this early stage, we see the elements that will come to be standard uh, in Buddhist imagery. So here on the right is a stele from 800 years later with many of those same elements. He's making a different gesture. Here he's ca calling on the earth to witness his enlightenment or his triumph over um, illusion and sin. And there are certainly differences. The th lotus throne is more pronounced. Um, his hair, you hear, see here, instead of the kaparda, we have the ush ushishna, ush <laughs> ushnisha, um, which looks like a hair-covered bump. It's kind of like a, a hair bun and so forth. So the style has changed, the way in which things are represented, but we still have the same components. Now, in between the uh, creation of these two steles, we have this one, which is depicting a specific moment in the life of Buddha uh, when he preached his first sermon. And the mudra he is making here means that he is setting the wheel of law into motion. He is establishing the dharma. And indeed, at the base of the throne, uh, in the center, we see a wheel that is represented not seen from the side, but from the front, as if it is moving towards us. And then we have his the listeners um, listening to his sermon on either side of that wheel. This particular sculpture is produced during the Gupta period, which is considered to be the golden age of Indian art by many. Uh, it's a period in which the Gupta dynasty ruled over several kingdoms and established a period of peace and prosperity uh, during which there were many, many cultural accomplishments in literature, uh, philosophy, the sciences, art, and so forth. And they achieved in art, in sculpture, a uh, kind of perfection of this very graceful, idealized representation of the human body. So here we have uh, in this image of the Buddha, we can certainly tell that he's a human. We know, you know, what this shape or this form is. So it's not so stylized that it's unrecognizable, but this is not exactly a realistic representation of the human body. It's very graceful. It's simplified. Um, the fingers have a kind of graceful limpness to it almost. Uh, and everything is radically reduced to not just, um, serve the function of a devotional image, but also to capture this peaceful aura that the Buddha exudes. Now, the rise of Hinduism um, in art coincides with a similar decline in Buddhism. Uh, around the 4th and 5th centuries, we see fewer and fewer Buddhist monuments uh, and more and more Hindu monuments being um, commissioned. Hinduism emerged really very early on. Uh, we see 
signs of a indigenous religion in the Indus River Valley civilization. There are artifacts that indicate that there were uh, cults to different nature deities. Um, there was the worship of an earth mother, which is extremely common in uh, prehistoric um, cultures all around the world. Later, during the historic period, we have the uh, production of texts in Sanskrit called the Vedas that were written over a very long period of time, the earliest written in 1500 BCE. And in these texts, we have the uh, descriptions of different gods who rule over the various elements of nature. Over time, these different gods uh, merged, blended, split into other ones so that we have uh, all kinds of different deities in this larger pantheon. And at some point, the idea w was that all of these were different deities were subsumed under the heading of Brahma, and Brahma being the uh, great, the great energy, the great deity that um, encompasses everything, including all of these smaller or more specific, rather not smaller, but more specific manifestations or avatars of the Brahmanic energy. And so there is this intense fluidity of identity in which one deity flows into the other because they're all part of Brahma. And so just as there's, you know, one, you can take one part and it belongs to the whole and vice versa, the whole is composed of many parts so that the two are interchangeable in a sense. In the same way, one of the core uh, beliefs or ideas in Hinduism is that this divine energy has different forms or manifestations. There's a sattvic or holy um, energy, creative energy. Uh, ragasic is active, and then tamasic energy is destructive energy. And so the Brahmanic triad uh, takes the this divine energy and has Brahma as the creator, Vishnu as the preserver, and Shiva is as the destroyer, but they're all the same energy simply manifested in these different forms. Now, those who are devotees of Shiva uh, believe him to be the supreme deity, and he too then has the three uh, different energetic manifestations. Ashiva Mahadeva means um, the great god, so the supreme deity, Shiva. And here we see a representation of Shiva Mahadeva in which his, uh, this plurality is made visible by a single body with three heads. So on the right, we have Parvati, who is Shiva's uh, consort and also the manifestation of his uh, Shakti, or feminine energy. In the center is Shiva himself, and then on the left is Shiva's uh, tamasic form, um, Bahairava. And then another marker of how you can recognize a Hindu deity is often the presence of their mount, their vehicle. And Shiva rides a bull. Uh, you can tell that this is not just any bull because he has a third eye on his forehead. So this brings us to an important point about Hindu art is that it is not meant to be a literal representation of what the deities are believed to look like. Rather, these are illustrations of concepts. And so every element in this statue is meant to tell us something about these deities, about these um, forms that are all, again, part of this larger whole. 
So how then um, does Hinduism differ from Buddhism? What is the relationship here? Well, it depends on who you ask, but artistically, at least, we can characterize Hinduism as having this great emphasis on becoming, on expanding and unfolding, on everything being connected, uh, and this really dynamic sort of movement from one thing to another, uh, and energy as the small unfolds into the large, the microcosm and the macrocosm, multiplicity in unity. Buddhism, by contrast, artistically emphasizes being, a cessation of striving as the enlightenment is achieved, a stillness, a peace, a kind of surrender to um, the higher state of being, a kind of uh, giving up of the an existence as we know it, locked in this cycle of suffering. Now, they agree on several uh things, several beliefs. Uh, among them are that both have codes for ethical living. Uh, both view the sensory world as somehow illusory or false, that it's not the whole story. Uh, and both use art for contemplation, not simply as an aesthetic um, object for pleasure, but actually as a tool to achieve a greater understanding, greater connection with the divine. Now, for Buddhism, as we've seen, uh, they established a very effective form of representation to express all of these elements. Here we have a image of the Buddha uh, from Nepal, and it very well expresses this idea of stillness, of peace, of solidity, of um, the inwardness of the being. They have a very, very slender body here that doesn't look realistic. There's no sense of outward strength about it, and yet it has this real solidity. In fact, the whole form makes a pyramid, which is one of the most stable structures visually. There's no sense that this figure is going to get up and move. He's here forever. He's grounded. He's left the cycle of time and has moved into the eternity beyond time. Now, this is not going to be an adequate mode of representation, however, for Hinduism. There's no sense of enfolding and expanding and movement and kinetic energy dy dynamism here. Instead, to find the uh, visual forms that will be well suited to Hindu art, we actually have to go back. And it turns out that these Hindu forms of art and representation have coexisted alongside the Buddhist forms this whole time. So here is a close up of one of the Tauranas at the Great Stupa at Sanji. And one of the bracket figures uh, we see here, this is a type of nature deity called a yakshi. And yakshis are uh, embodiments of fertility, abundance, growth, life. Um, and in fact, we see here her foot resting against the tree trunk, causing it by her touch to flower, to burst into fruit. There's a extreme emphasis on her female sex markers uh, to emphasize this fertility role. And uh, it's this type of figure that we see providing the artistic basis um, for later representations of Hindu deities. Here, for example, is a corner from a much larger site at Ajanta. Ajanta is an incredible place uh, in which whole halls and chapels and um, rooms are carved out of the stone of a cliff. Uh, and so there's nothing is built here in the sense of adding elements. It's all carved out of the living stone. And this particular corner is really interesting because we have here the Buddha in his niche looking quite calm. He's making his uh, mudra of setting the wheel of law, the dharma, into motion. Uh, we recognize him by his uh, head, his cranial bump, his elongated ears, his yogic meditation pose, the mudra, and his general demeanor of calmness and solidity. It's very iconic. 
Contrast that with this group, this figure group, which existed or perpendicular um, to the Buddha. And we see that the uh, Nagaraja, that is the snake king, is looking over at the Buddha as if he's listening to this sermon that he's preaching. So uh, we have the idea here that all of nature, all of the deities and energies in the world are all looking to the Buddha, acknowledging his wisdom. Stylistically, though, we have a huge difference between the way that Buddha is represented and the way that the Nagaraja and his queen are shown. They are represented with such liveliness and uh, naturalism, not in the sense that they look real. You would never con con uh, confuse these bodies for being real human bodies. But their poses, the sense of roundness, of ease, of flexibility, and movement is really striking. I love the movement of the queen to the right, the way her head turns, she has her arm resting, her leg up. Uh, there's a sense of shifting and of movement, of liveness, of expanding. Uh, and it is this uh, type of energy that we find really uh, epitomized in the bronzes produced during the Chola period in South India. The Cholas um, really excelled in the production of smaller bronze statues, like this one here, in which we see uh, Shiva as the Nataraja, that is Lord of the Dance. And Shiva here is dancing. He's crushing underfoot a personification of ignorance um, or darkness. And he is dancing. We can see his um, figures twi figure twisting. He has a leg up in the air. His arms are gesturing. And in fact, he has not two, but four arms. And this um, multi-limbedness is one of the uh, most characteristic features of Hindu art. And it's, again, as I mentioned earlier, important to understand that it is not meant to uh, suggest that Shiva is a human-formed deity who has four arms. Instead, it is because the artist, the sculptor, wanted to convey something about Shiva's nature as a deity, as a form of the divine energy. And in order to do that, he needed more hands. So you need more hands, you just add them. So we have Shiva making these mutras which hit with his front hands, uh, his back Right hand holds a hourglass drum, as an example of what you see here. His back left hand has holds a flame, and he dances within this circle of flames, uh, this eternal ring, suggesting that Shiva as Nataraja is dancing a kind of eternal dance, that this is a perpetual unfolding, it is said to be a dance, um, a furious dance, an ecstatic dance, that is both destructive and creative at the same time. And this kind of dynamic energy um, is completely... Um, or takes priority over any sense of visual realism. So this is the difference between naturalism and realism. Realism is something that you could perhaps confuse for being the real thing. Naturalism has a sense of believability about it through movement or liveliness. There's just something you can't quite put your finger on, but it seems really natural, not stiff, not false in a way. Here we see that this type of energy is not limited to three-dimensional objects. Here we have a relief sculpture that was, again, produced during the Tola period, showing Shiva here, not as Nataraja, excuse me, but as the slayer of the elephant demon. But again, he's... His uh, warrior pose is extremely similar to his dancing pose. Again, because it is a dance, not simply of, you know, artistic dance. Uh, it's not interpretive dance. It's a creative and destructive dance. The dance is a personification of the energy of Shiva. It's an expression of his activity. 
And you can only make out the elephant demon here by his trunk. He's just really kind of <laughs> overwhelmed by the figure of Shiva, who is um, twisting and gesturing. Um, his hair is flying out behind him in these curls. Uh, we have this garland over his head uh, that creates this arch. And there's this twisting of the body as legs go one way, the torso goes another. Um, and we have figures going to, you know, willy nilly out behind him, kind of scattered by this force. One of the really interesting things about the Chola bronzes is that they don't have to have dramatic movement in order to suggest energy or power. Here we see Vishnu, another one of the major Hindu deities, uh, in his form as the uh, man lion or Narashimha. Narashimha is often approached as a guardian deity, especially for the worshippers of Vishnu uh, who are subjected to religious persecution. In one of the most common stories about Narashimha, he is believed to have come into being in order to defeat an enemy who could be killed neither during the day, nor the night, nor inside, nor outside, nor with any weapon or by any person or animal. And so Narashimha comes into being as the way to get past all of these uh, limitations or uh, rules. And so he kills the enemy during uh, twilight on the threshold of his home with his own hands and he is neither human nor animal as he is both. This sculpture represents him in this yoga pose with his ankles crossed and a band around under his knees to support his knees, hold them up. And there's this sense of energy and dynamism as if Nashimha is simply seated. He's not resting so much as he is waiting. He's ready to spring up at a moment's notice. And much of this is due to the crossing of diagonals generated by his arms and legs, as we have lines both moving up and down. So we have the solidity uh, that is formed by a pyramidal structure, much like we would see with a Buddha sculpture. But then we also have the upward thrust of the uh, knees and his back arms, which move the energy upward to create a very solid composition that is still energetic. Now, the multiple limbs are used primarily to convey more information about a deity in order to uh, carry the necessary attributes or make the necessary mudras to give the viewer adequate information and help them in their contemplation and reverence to the deity. But this sculpture of Vajra Bhairava is a great example of how these multiple limbs also have an undeniable aesthetic and emotional psychological impact. This image is nothing if not terrible in the sense that it is capable of evoking terror. The multiple arms radiating out from the main body each carry a kind of weapon, and there's not one but two rows of all of these multiple limbs, uh, so that there is just this visual uh, multiplicity that is almost overwhelming. We have the multiple heads stacked on top of and surrounding the main buffalo head, and then a flame backing all of these, uh, sort of uh, flaming hair, I guess you could say, uh, a belt of skulls, and indeed this terrible quality, this um, frightening and powerful and destructive quality is intentional. The devotee is meant to contemplate this image in order to overcome their own fear of death. And this is also expressed in the sexual union between Vajbhajrayava and his consort Vajravitali, as they are engaged in a sexual embrace, signaling that death and life, destruction and creation, that the divisions between between them are simply illusions of our lesser, less enlightened state of being, and really all of these things are one. And so the 
purpose of this image as a contemplative device is to overcome such fears, to overcome such divisions, and achieve early 1500s and higher But it wasn't until the early 1600s that they became the Mughal Empire and were established in India. The Mughals were Mongolian, and they had close cultural and artistic ties with the Ottoman and Safavid courts, the Persian artistic tradition. And once they established themselves in India, they also began establishing their own courtly culture and artistic uh, culture, in which they imported artists from the Safavid Empire and the Ottoman Empire to produce the kinds of illuminated manuscripts that they excelled in, like the example that you see here. They were excellent at producing these works of art, these illustrated books, with meticulous, beautifully decorated details uh, and a very textile-like decorative properties and borders. Over time, these artists also trained native Indian artists, and so this own Mughal style developed. The Mughal court was extremely cosmopolitan, very multicultural. Uh, Akbar and Jahangir especially were very strong patrons of multiplicity of cultural traditions and religions and so forth. And you can see signs of that in this image of the Darbar or reception hall of Jahangir. For example, in the corner above his head, there's an icon of the Virgin Mary. And in the myriad of people that we see gathered in his court, we see among them a Jesuit priest who would have been there to teach some of the European visual traditions to the artists in the court as well. A wonderful example of this type of Mughal courtly art comes from this illustrated manuscript of the life of Krishna, Krishna being one of the avatars of Vishnu and an extremely popular deity. So here we see a, an image from this story, and we have the birth of Krishna, and down in the bottom right, he is represented as a blue little baby uh, with his parents, his earthly parents worshiping him. And up in the sky, the other Hindu deities are gathered there, sort of overseeing the events. And what's interesting here is that we have Persian artists depicting a Hindu scene with Islamic architectural elements, but using European perspective styles to represent depth and space. So they're combining all of these different traditions, visual and cultural traditions, into the production of this manuscript that was commissioned by an Islamic emperor in an Indian court. One of the most famous, well, certainly the most famous product of the Mughal courtly art uh, came through a commission by Shah Jahan, and that is the Taj Mahal, which was constructed in the early to mid 17th century in Agra. The Taj Mahal is a mausoleum that was commissioned by Shah Jahan to serve as a tomb for his beloved wife, who died after giving birth to their 14th child. In terms of architecture, this is purely Islamic. It owes much more to the Islamic structures of the Persian, Ottoman, uh, Safavid empires than it does to any Hindu or Buddhist or Indian structure. However, the technique used to make it uh, is heavily rooted in and indebted to its location in the Indian subcontinent. Islamic structures are almost always made of brick because that they don't have um, readily available stone in those the desert regions farther west where Islam originated. In India, however, there's a wealth of stone and an extremely long tradition of stone cutting and working. And so the Taj Mahal utilizes stone and was constructed by Hindu craftsmen and stone cutters under the direction of the chief architect who is Islamic. And so we have this coming together of multiple traditions and resources to create this object or this site rather that has become really emblematic of India and its culture on the world stage. The Taj Mahal also 
acts as a wonderful segue into our next talk, which is going to be looking at art of the Islamic Mediterranean. So the nations surrounding the Islamic um, or surrounding the Mediterranean Sea and the visual and architectural traditions that developed there. So I hope you will join us next time for our talk. And thank you so much for tuning in.